Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12 this morning as we begin a new series called Common Ground. We're looking at the New Testament, mo- New Testament model of community and Christianity, what it looks like, what brings us together, what has Christ called us to stand on as Christians, what becomes our footing as a community of believers. And so over the next couple of weeks, we'll be spending some time in Romans 12 and 13 and 14. Over the past decades, a tremendous amount of time has been put into the research of finding what makes a person happiness. The research of happiness. What makes you happy? What makes me happy? And interesting, interestingly enough is that it's not like 200 different factors that make up our happiness. When researchers collect the data and they find out what people are contributing to their happiness, it actually, researchers tell us, that it, it is, comes down to about three or four things that need to be present in a person's life to be happy. You want to know what they are? All right, I'm going to share the the data here. Number one, a nuclear family. You guys, this is not a surprise to you, but a family, a mom, a dad, cousins, brothers, sisters, as they say in the South, your kinfolk, the people that are in your home, especially for young people, 18 and under in a home, the nuclear family is so important that you have someone that is there for you that believes in you. Number two is close friends. Now, we're not talking about acquaintance, we're not uh, acquaintances, and we're not talking about people that just kind of know you. We're talking about the people that really know you, the people that really know me. Not the me that I project to a big crowd, but the people that know me. The good, the bad, and ugly. It's so important. Number three is meaningful work. So you have something that you believe in, what you do what, with your hands, with your work, with your life, it's meaningful. And so what's interesting is that it's not just people who made a lot of money, but people who made a lot of money, a little bit of money, people who had glamorous jobs, but also people who had ordinary jobs. And here was the, the key, something that you do that gives into the flourishing of human life, that what you, have, what you do has purpose. Number four is a theology or a philosophy to make sense not only of life, but of death and suffering. When the bottom drops out of life, what do you stand on? What gives you hope? We call that in this room here faith in Jesus Christ. It is our hope. It's something bigger than us that we stand on no matter what happens in life. We know we are secure in Jesus Christ. And so there it is, family, friends, work, and faith. It's that easy. Check the box, we all go home, happy campers, all right? Don't we wish it was that easy? Don't we wish it was just checking a box and saying, check, 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 check? But here's the reality. We live in a culture and a period of history that is pulling at those things, that is hollowing out family, friends, work, faith. They're they're going after them. And there are many factors in the degradation of these things and why it's harder and harder to have these things present in our life. But one of the biggest things, and it's not a shock to us, is that we live in a digital world. This little device, we live behind screens. We live in digital worlds. We spend much of our times in digital worlds. Many of you work remotely, especially after COVID. And so your coworkers are little squares on a Zoom screen. Like, that's your coworkers. They're digital. And so digital, the world, is not all bad. Lots of good things. But if we're not careful, it can push us into extremes. It can push us, on the one hand, into kind of this radical individualism where all I need is me, me and AI, and we're good, all right? I don't need anyone else. I'm good. Just look out for me. I don't need people. I'm good. That's what I'll do it my way. Research has said that in the last few years, now we're not talking decades, we're saying years, that the average uh, friendship, so the average person in America used to have 3.2 friends, now has 1.8 friends. America, we have cut the number of friendships in half in America in the last few years. 40% of Americans have zero to one confidant. That means 40% of you in the room, according to the studies, 
don't have anyone to share joys or suffering or talk about inflation or elections or how bad the cardinals are doing. You don't have the people. As a whole, America, we're getting lonelier and lonelier and lonelier. So on one hand, the digital world kind of pulls at us to be our own person and to do our own thing and to kind of just live by ourselves. But on the other side, it can push us into what they say is like this tribalism. So it's where you want to be around people that think just like you and act just like you. It's this idea of centering around not what you love, but what you hate. Not what you're for, but what you're against. You're kind of circling the wagons. And the danger with both of these is that our people become more online than real world. So when you start talking about my people, my friends, They're digital, they're online. So what is our hope? What does the Bible teach us? What is the New Testament model for church? How do we push back against a world that is pulling us away from community? Well, we find that in Romans chapter 21. And it's what we're gonna be looking at in this series, the model for New Testament church. Living in a postmodern, post-Christian, post-everything culture, we're gonna look at Jesus' compelling vision for the church as in alternative to what culture is saying. How do we live as a church in this times with isolation and tribalism? Well, let's begin. When we get to Romans, Romans is a wonderful book, uh, as all the books of the Bible, but Romans is full. The first 11 chapters are full of all the reason why we believe in God, his mercy and his richness. It's the plan of salvation. It's the belief as Christians. When you get to chapter 12, we move from belief to behavior. How do we act? Here's what we believe. Jesus came on earth and he died for us and he rose again. And in light of that, how do we live our lives? And so we get to chapter 1 and we're going to just go through uh, verse 1 through 8, kind of break this down a little bit and see what God's word has for us. It says in verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. In view of God's mercy. If we miss this, then everything we talk about over the next couple weeks is not going to make a whole lot of sense. Paul is saying this. It starts here. The key to Christian life, the key to obeying him is found right here. Our response in living, the way we live our life is in response to the mercy of God, not the, pre- the pressures of culture. We live our lives in God's mercy when we think about what he's done in Jesus. When we look at that and in light of what God has done for you and for me, it affects the way we live our life. And he gives two places. He says, first, that your bodies are to be offered as living sacrifices, Your physical world, what you do with your body, your sexuality, your hobbies, where you go, how you spend your money. He says that in view of God's mercy, it changes the way what you do with your body. And then in verse 2, it goes on. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not just the physical, but also our thoughts, what we think. What you think about the people, what you spend your time and your mental energy on, he's saying in light of God's mercy, God wants us to give every part of our life to him, for him to use every part, to not hold any part of it back, but to offer it to him. He says there in verse 1 that he calls the Roman church something. He uses a unique phrase. He says, Brothers and sisters. He doesn't say church. He doesn't say congregation. He doesn't say people. He calls them brothers and sisters, which is the Greek word for family. Now, here's what's amazing. The Roman church was made up of all kinds of people, single, married, man, woman, rich, poor. But more than that, it was made up of Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Greeks. They hated each other. Just a few years before this, they were at each other's throats. These people that would have been sitting in the church would have been at each other's throats, not liking each other. And now Paul refers to this group of people as family. Because of Jesus, you're part of a family. 
The same in this room. You're sitting next to people who think, look, act, are in different socioeconomic brackets than you. You couldn't gather a group like this to hang out for any other reasons, all right? You don't just come here to hang out because you like these people and they think just like you. What has brought us into the room today? Jesus. Because of Jesus, you are sitting and serving and living among a group of people who it's only by the grace of God, it's only by the mercy of God that God has brought us into this place. I often tell my kids that because you're a Hartman, because you carry the Hartman name, you have to act differently, all right? Your friends might act a certain way, other families might do things, but as a Hartman, you're going to act a certain way. There's some things that you can do and some things that you can't do. Paul is saying here, because you carry the name of Jesus, you're called to a different life. You're called to a different standard. He says, the moment you said yes to Jesus, and I know there may be some in the room today where you haven't said yes to Jesus. I invite you to listen in today because the invitation is for all. And as we're going to see, there's not a list of 10 things you have to do to get into the family of God. It's actually right here in verse 1, if you receive his mercy. If you say yes to his mercies, you're welcomed into a family. And now the name of Jesus is a banner over your life. You belong to Jesus. You belong to his family. And if you take the name of Jesus, Paul is saying, hey, listen, there are some things that you're going to have to live differently. There are some different ways of thinking and active. You can't just have control over your life and do whatever you want. He says, you're to offer yourself to God. And that changes our behavior. And in verse 3, we begin to see the different way that, that the mercies of God causes us to live. So let's look at verse 3. It says, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment and accordings with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. Because you're a family member now, there are some family rules. There are some house rules. Because you love Jesus and you said yes to him, you're in a family bigger than yourself. And that means something. And Paul says, hey, now that you're in this family, you have to think a certain way. You have to think differently than maybe you want. And he says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Now, the word there for highly means to see yourself in the wrong way. To see yourself not in the way that you should be. And he says, instead of thinking yourself too highly, you should look at yourself with sober judgment. Again, what Paul's saying here is to see yourself the right way. What's the opposite of sober? Come on, you can say it. Some of you are like, can I say drunk? Yes, drunk. <laughs> First service even had you beat there. Come on. Yes, the opposite of sober is drunk. Now, what happens when a person gets drunk? All right? There's a reason they call alcohol liquid courage. It's because when you become intoxicated in alcohol and alcohol gets flowing through your system, you start seeing yourself differently than reality, all right? So this is why a five-foot-nothing guy walks up to a six-foot-five big burly guy in a bar and say, I'll take you out in the parking lot. Why? Because when he's drunk, he's not seeing himself in reality. He's doing things. He's thinking too highly. It, can, it puffs him up. It's conceited. And so we have this, but alcohol, getting drunk, can also do the opposite, can it? It can actually cause you to think of yourself in despair and think of yourself as no good and nothing and meaningless. And that's why people can drink them into themselves into despair because it actually causes you, it magnifies despair and it causes you to look at yourself in such a low status. And so this word here, when he says, don't think of yourself in the wrong view, but rather think of yourself soberly, he says, just like alcohol can con contaminate, he says, pride and despair can cause us in the church, in God's, what he wants to do, it can affect you. It can pull you away from looking at yourself the way you should. And so he says that you are to look at yourself in the right way. So how do we do that? Well, he says, 
in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each one of you. In the ESV, it says, by the measure of faith given to you. I don't know if they still do this, but when I was a kid, they used to have this, the presidential physical fitness test. You guys remember this in gym class? I don't know if they, yeah, oh, I, a collective, oh, uh, yes, yeah. I don't know if they still do this, but it was a test where they would compile all the data and there would be a national average of pull-ups, sit-ups, and how fast you could run the mile, and your goal was to be at least the average, all right? In my gym class, if you fell below the average, you had to run laps. You had to kind of get yourself back in shape, and what the presidential fitness test did is it became a measurement, a standard to see what you should be at as a 10-year-old kid, how healthy, how strong I should be. It became a standard to judge yourself again. What Paul is saying here, a measure of faith, he says you want to know how to, how to look at yourself soberly? You want to know how to think of yourself within the body of Christ? As a Christian, you want to know how you should uh, how, what your value is and what your worth is, he says, it's by the measure of faith. What Paul is saying here is faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You want to know what your measure, your standard, is you hold your life up against the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's where you find out what your value is and what you're worth and if you belong. And here's what it does. Here's the power of the gospel. When you think of yourself too highly and there's pride and you think, I don't need anyone else, I'm good, what the finished work of the cross does is it begins to reveal that you had no part in your salvation except to receive it. It was all the work of Jesus. It was all the blood of Jesus. And what the gospel does is actually can pull the prideful down and bring humility But it also does, when it reaches into those that are in despair and low and they say, I have nothing to offer the church. I have nothing to give. It actually lifts them up. The power of the gospel can bring the the prideful down and it can bring the low up because the low, when they look at the finished work of Jesus Christ, they realize that because of Jesus, they are made righteous like everyone else. We all come into the family of God on the same footing. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that great that the way soberly, the way we see ourselves in this church, the right way to see yourself is that you belong to God. You have a place, not that you're a superstar. This is not a church of superstars. We know that Jesus is the only star. He's the hero. He's the savior. And we all get to serve him in response, in view of God's mercy. We think of ourselves differently. Not up here, not down here, but we are the body together that God uses. Verse 4 goes on with this illustration, talking about this, and he says this, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. Paul moves to a metaphor here using the human body. He says, just like I and you, we have a body. I have a body up here. It is one body, but it has many members. It has many parts, fingers and toes and kneecaps and skeletons and veins and arteries and organs. They don't all have the same function. They all do something differently, but those functions are not competing. My heart isn't trying to outdo my lungs. My hand isn't trying to outdo my foot. I've got one body, many members, all of them are working together. My body is working together to keep me alive for growth and for health. He goes on to say, so in Christ, so in the family of God, so in Crosspoint, those that are in Christ, though many, though there's a lot of us, form one body. And each member belongs to each other. One body Many members, different functions. Here's what he's saying. He is speaking to our identity as believers. Most of us in the room understand that we belong to God. We are children of God. That is part of what we've been taught. I am a child of God. Yes, we belong to God. That is amazingly important. 
But we can't miss the second part. We also belong to each other. We also belong. I belong to you. You belong to, uh, to me. So not only are we children of God, we belong to God, but we are brothers and sisters now in Christ. We belong to each other. He, Paul says that we are one body, and although you look different and act differently and you come from a different part of town, we are one body working towards one goal in view of God's mercy, we are living our life for Christ as Christians on purpose for God, but we're doing it with all of us working towards that goal, all of us doing our part, all of us having our uh, different function. My pinky finger is kind of does its own thing every once in a while, all right? So I'm a saxophone player. So as a kid, when I was little, learning the saxophone, there are keys on a saxophone for your pinkies that you have to reach to get them, all right? And so it's kind of developed a habit that my pinkies are always kind of sticking out weird, all right? They're kind of always doing their own thing. It was great when I went to London and I could drink the tea like the Europeans, but my pinkies are always doing their own thing. But as weird as my pinkies look, they're still part of my body. They're still part of my hand. If one day Mr. Pinky woke up and said, hey, I'm tired of this whole doing what you do, going where you want to go. I'm tired of it. I'm out of here. And my pinky decided to just detach from the body, detach from the hand, and just kind of hang out on the table by itself. <laughs> One lady over here is like, oh, my goodness. What would happen to pinky? Wouldn't, life wouldn't go well, would it? <clears throat> Shrivel up, <laughs> die. That's because my pinky finger needs my hand, which needs my arm, which needs my shoulder and my torso. It needs my body. It needs my heart pumping blood into it. It needs it. And just as silly, I know it sounds silly to think of my pinky not being part of the body, and yet there are Christians who feel that they don't need to be connected to the body, that they don't need each other that somehow they're okay by themselves. And God would say, no, that's not the design. God has designed us to need the body, to be connected, to be in fellowship. And so he says, you're a body. And what's interesting, Paul writes this to the universal kind of global church. That means we're part of the body of Christ, which means we're brothers and sisters with our brothers and sisters in India and Nepal and Africa and Lettington and Jubilee Church in the city. We're brothers and sisters. But Paul is writing specifically to the local church. In Ephesians, he does that. In Romans, he does that. In 1 Corinthians, he's writing to the context of a local church. So this whole body metaphor is made to be lived out in a local church with people who know, you know them, they know you, people that you laugh with, people you cry with, people that annoy you from time to time, brothers and sisters that sit in your seat that you've been sitting in here in this church for years, and how dare they? Yes, those kind of brothers and sisters. You need them, and they need you. Yes, I need Jesus every day, but I also need the church. I need you. I need you in my life. One of the most valuable gifts that God, earthly gifts that God has given me, apart from my wife and my children, is this congregation. It's the body of Christ. It's the community of his church. I began to think, and maybe... For Jess and I, we've never lived close to our family. We've always, because of ministry, we've always lived far away, so we've needed the church. The church has become our family. But I began to think back over the years, and I thought of Mabel Lee. When I was eight years old in a small country church in Pennsylvania, there was a lady named Mabel Lee, and she always looked 100 years old. I don't know how old, but she always, I just, even as a kid, I was there for like 20 years, and she always looked 100 years old. I don't know how old she really was, but... <clears throat> Mabel Lee would teach the Bible lesson for our VBS every year. And Sister Mabel Lee would get up there and she would stare, share the story of Jesus. And when I was eight years old, she shared the story of Jesus and the cross and forgiveness and salvation. And I raised my hand and Sister Mabel Lee prayed over me. When I became a Christian, when I stepped into the body, she was there. And then there was a guy named Ken Carlson who was my youth director, youth leader at our church. And Ken would pick me up 
sometimes before school or early in the morning and we'd go to Dunkin Donuts and he'd get me a donut and he would drink a coffee and he would just ask me, how are you doing as a high schooler? What are you struggling with? What are some of your temptations? What are you, how are you living out your faith? And uh, it was Ken who believed in me when, I, when the Lord spoke in my heart at a camp that I was gonna go into ministry, that I felt that call into ministry. It was Ken who at the same time I didn't know, Ken, God had also spoken in him to confirm that in me. And so Ken, over the next months, kept saying, hey, has God spoken anything to you? And I'd say, nope, nothing. Because I was too afraid. No one had ever gone into ministry. There were no pastors in my family. I didn't even know what a pastor did. And Ken just kept encouraging me. And one day I said, Ken, I... I think God might have called me into ministry. And he said, yes, I know. He said, God spoke the same thing to me. And because of Ken, he affirmed God's calling. I don't know if I would be in ministry if guys like Ken weren't there for me. And then I think of the night in November of 2011 when the caseworker dropped Angelina, our adopted daughter, off at our home. She was nine months old. She came with the clothes on her back, and that's all. The caseworker dropped her off, have a good night, and Jess and I were suddenly parents in a moment. We didn't have anything. We made a few calls, and within 24 hours, we had bags of clothes and toys and bottles and formulas and a pack and plate. The church stepped up. They were at our door. We had more than we needed In 24 hours, the church stepped up and God used the church. We needed them. In a moment when we were desperate, God used his church to step in and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Or the couples that made us meals when our son Caleb at eight years old, they thought he had spinal meningitis and they rushed him into the emergency room and he was there for a week and the couples who dropped off meals and prayed with us and babysat Angelina and and all the things that we needed. Or the, the day, November 1st, 2017, when Jess and I flew out to Crosspoint, to St. Louis, to check out Crosspoint for the first time to interview here. None of you knew who we were, but we walked into this place for the very first time, and we sat right here in the middle. We sat down. Back then, it was the, the pink pews. <laughs> we sat down, and... <clears throat> A couple named John and Becky Melton walked us, up to us and introduced themselves and began to talk to us. And I remember Becky saying, oh, we are so glad that you're here. That did something. That impacted us. That was the church being the church. Policies and programs and procedures, yes, we need all those things. Yes, but it's the people. The power is in people of God who allow God to use them with their giftings, who give their lives as living sacrifices, not because the church tells them they should, but in response, in light of the mercy of God. Remember verse 1, we can't forget it. Why do we do this? Why did the church, why did they show up for Jess and I? In light of God's mercy. Something bigger, something beyond themselves. They had given their life to serving the church. I thank God for the people of this church, the more than 600 volunteers who give their time, treasure, and talent to this church and serve so that our ministries can go forth. Romans 12, 6, it goes on in the last two verses and we'll be done. It says that we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If, you're, if it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What is Paul saying? Hey, whatever you do, do it with all your heart. Put your heart into it. Serve. Now, Paul's not saying that some of you get to give and some of you don't and some of you get to serve. A lot of this, this is not an extensive list. It's not a comprehensive list. If you don't see yours on there, that's okay. All of us are called to give and serve in some aspects. So some of the gifts we all do, but all of us have been uniquely gifted, that God has put something in us. And did you see there it says we all have different gifts? Here's the beauty of that. 
Because we all have different gifts, no person is ultimate and no person is unnecessary. I love it. If we all had the same gifts, do you know how terrible that would be? We'd all be fighting for the pulpits. We'd all be one up here. And then, you, you know, it would be like, uh, he's better and she's better. And we'd all be competing and we'd either feel awesome or terrible. But because God dispersed gifts to all of us and they're all different and your personality is different. Not one of us is a superstar and not one of us doesn't matter. Not one is ultimate. Not one is unnecessary. We all matter. There's not a single ungifted person in the room. So take a deep breath. None of you are ungifted. All of you have a gift. Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Good works. Serving the body. Serving the kingdom, which God prepared beforehand. Do you know what's neat? God designed you with a gift in mind. It says that he knew what you needed, what you would use for his kingdom, for the good work of the gospel. He knew what he needed you to do before he created you. He didn't create you and then say, huh, what are we going to do with this one? (laughs) He designed you with a purpose. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. That means it's not an accident. That means what you have, we need at Crosspoint. To the extroverts, we need you at the door, not just holding a door open. We have, our doors are automatic. We could hold the door open with a machine. We need people who love others and have the gift of welcoming. We need those who can hold a little baby in our nursery so mom and dad can hear the message. We need greeters. We need those that have been gifted in finance to help us run and steward the money here. We know those with hospitality to open up their homes for life groups. We need those that love outreach to use their giftings to tutor and to make hot dogs for outreaches and hand them out in the name of Jesus. We need it all. We need you. Being part of the body of Christ, serving and being served, it unlocks God's deepest purpose for you. I really believe that there are parts of our faith and parts of our experiences with God that cannot be unlocked by ourselves. They get unlocked when you serve. And not that it's levels. I'm not talking about levels. I'm talking that because our design is a body and to function, There are times when I need other people and they need me to experience the fullness. Haven't you experienced this? When someone was there and God used them in a profound way to impact your life for the gospel. A pastor once said, and I heard this, he says, nothing helps you grow in your relationship with Jesus like helping someone else grow in their relationship with Jesus. The joy of discovering your gift and using it. In Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about the same thing. You can go back and read it. He echoes the words to the Romans, but in, he talks about unity and the need for using our gift. And in verse 14, Ephesians 4 chapter 14, it says, then we will no longer be infants. So he says, when you find unity in Christ, you begin to serve There's a maturity that happens. You're no longer infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. The scheming, the things that try to pull us away from community. We feel it, don't we? The isolation, the tribalism that try to pull us away from being part of a community. I would say that if your life looks like verse 14, It feels like you're being tossed around. And I'm not talking trials and suffering. Don't hear me. But if you're like, you don't know what you believe and you're not not sure if this is your church and you're not, you're kind of getting tossed around. Maybe it's because you haven't pressed into the body. You haven't let the body of Christ come around you and embrace you and feel and cry on someone's shoulder and have someone text you thinking about you today. Maybe it's because you've been pulling away I really believe this, and last point, spiritual maturity 
can only happen in the context of biblical community. Some of you, you may read that and you're like, ah. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you're, you, you can't be saved and stay at home because we're saved by grace in Jesus alone. So a person can be saved and go to heaven and not be plugged in at a church, absolutely. But I don't think you can be a devoted disciple and I don't think you can grow to maturity in Christ without the body, without other people. I just don't. You may disagree with me, but I, I, what I read through the New Testament and the Bible over and over again, I don't think we were not designed to grow in a vacuum. We were not designed to grow in isolation. We just weren't. And so if you think you're gonna grow as a Christian in a vacuum, you're going against your design, your God-given design. You were designed to grow in the greenhouse of the body with its flaws and with its problems, but that is where you were meant to grow in Christ. Now, some of you may say, well, Josh, I've been hurt by the church, so that's why I'm reluctant. That's, I just, you know, I'm keeping at a distance. I don't want to get involved because I've been hurt. And I would say this, first of all, I am sorry that that happened. Sorry that you were hurt by the church, but I will say this. The church, like any family, is flawed. We make mistakes. Things happen. But just like any healthy family, grace helps us move beyond mistakes. Grace, just like in my family, when I lose my temper and I say things, I'm so glad for the grace of my wife and my kids that say, Dad, we'll give you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. And we hug it out and we say, we need each other. We can't let, we don't want to divide. This family is important. You might have been hurt by the church, but I would offer you in view of God's mercy, in view of God's grace, the kind of grace that chased you down when you had walked out on God, that kind of grace that chased you down, would you offer that grace to the church? You've been forgiven of a lot. Can you forgive a church that has wounded you? Because on the other side of forgiveness and pushing in, on the other side of that, I think you're gonna find something beautiful. The beauty of gospel relationships. And so as we close, I wanna encourage you, think about where God wants to use you. We're not gonna get all into what's my gift and how to use it. I think we need to be careful that we don't get too caught up in finding the gift that we don't miss, we miss opportunities. J.D. Greer says this, that God loves to steer moving ships. And I think that's true, just start serving. Maybe today it's, hey, you sign up to do a test drive in, in our next step room. We have forms there that you can try anything in the church. You can try it and do a test drive. We'd love to just take that step. But I think maybe beyond that, yes, we want you to sign up, welcome to Crosspoint, and yes, take the next step and get involved. But maybe for some in the room, the step today is acknowledging that you really do need the body of Christ and that the body of Christ really does need you. We need you. You need us. And the gospel will come alive when you press in. Amen? Let's pray. Father, you're moving in this place. Your spirit is here. God, you're moving in some hearts. God, there may be some in this room that have thought maybe too highly that for whatever reason that they didn't need the church. Maybe it wasn't pride, but maybe it was just busyness. But they've thought that Sunday morning for an hour, is that's enough for them. Or maybe there's some in the room, God, that think too lowly that they have nothing to give. God, in light of the finished work of the cross, all of us stand before you as children of God and brothers and sisters of each other. We're all needed. God, would you help us? Lord, let us not miss this. In this day, in this time, in this culture, we need community. The church needs to stand up together to love one another, to live out the one another's of the New Testament. We need it more than ever, so God, help us. Let us not pull into isolation. Let us not give in to tribalism. Let us not attack, but let us love. Let us serve, and let us give our lives as living sacrifices. Help us. 
Help us to push in and experience the fullness of community. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name.